My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, the Lord Jesus has given you an identity. He has made you his very own. He has called you his child. May you know this truth. May you know this promise that as his children, one day you shall rest secure with him. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Not in some strange way, some existential way or ethereal way. But you came as a baby in a manger. You came and dwelt among us and grew into a man. You came and you, you gave your life so that we might have life forever with you. Lord, help us to live each day with this knowledge and this assurance that you are always with us, that you are always there for us, that you are never far from us. That as you heard the voice of your people of old, that you continue to hear our voices today. Lord, help us to always see your hand at work. Forgive us for those times when we miss, when we miss what you are doing. Help us to see, though, that you are in control. For you are almighty and all-powerful, and your love never fails. May you bless us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we've been a little bit of time away from the story, I thought this morning it might be a good idea to catch you all up. So I have a short video, it's about three minutes, about well, almost four minutes, and it's a story that it catches you up with where we left off, and it runs through really quickly the first nine chapters, and excuse me, today we'll pick up with chapter 10, and we'll see just where God leads his people as they stand tall and fall hard. In the beginning, God created the universe, and within it, a planet called Earth. God's Spirit hovered over the dark and empty surface, speaking life into it. Light appeared. Sky and land split from the oceans. Trees and plants grew. Days and nights began. And all kinds of creatures filled the earth. Humans were formed in God's image to continue God's work. Things were really good. But soon, humans decided we want to live our way, not God's. In their struggle for control, selfishness and violence filled the world. So God started over with just Noah and his family. A few generations later, God made this covenant to a man named Abraham. The land around you as far as you can see is now yours. Your family will be as many as the stars and will be my blessing to the entire world. Years passed. Then miraculously, in their old age, Abraham and his wife had their only son, Isaac, just as God promised decades earlier. Later, Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. Then Jacob had 12 sons. The youngest, Joseph, moved the family to Egypt, saving them from a famine. There, they grew into a large nation, a people called to be different, to remind everyone what it looks like to live in God's ways. Abraham's descendants, now called the people of Israel, were moved to Egypt by Joseph to save them from a famine. There they grew into a large nation. The Egyptians welcomed them at first, but soon this turned into fear and jealousy. The Israelites were forced to be slaves and do hard labor. But God heard their cries of pain. Through a humble leader named Moses and incredible signs and wonders, God led the Israelites in a great exodus back toward their promised land. As the Israelites journeyed through the desert, God guided them with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. The Israelites complained about being hungry and abandoned. So God sent birds and sweet flaky manna for them to eat and made fresh water pour from a rock. God even lived in the middle of their camp in a sacred tent called a tabernacle. Along their journey, God gave them special instructions called laws and commands guiding the Israelites to live differently, to show others how to follow God's ways. But the people complain, we don't want to live by these rules like slaves again. Living their own ways, the Israelites wandered the desert for 40 years. After decades of complaining and struggling in the desert, a new leader named Joshua charged the Israelites back into their homeland. Miraculously, God stopped the flow of the Jordan River so they could safely cross. God warned, drive out everyone who lives in the promised land or they will corrupt your lives. But the Israelites didn't listen, intermarrying and worshiping the false gods of the people who remain there. Soon, God's protection was removed and other nations overpowered Israel. In their defeat, they suffered, begging God for help. 
So God sent judges to lead them in battle defending the promised land. In victory, the people worshipped God, but soon after, they turned from God and lived their own rebellious ways. This became a pattern from generation to generation. This was a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Kind of a rough spot to pick up, isn't it? We left off with actually a great story of Ruth. Remember Ruth? She was that Moabite woman who the Lord used. To, she used her faithfulness to him and, and her devotion to her mother-in-law, Naomi, uh, to, 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 be, to continue his family line, to be part of his family line. And that's where we left off. But times, well, times changed, didn't they? Time went on and, and the people, they, they, they grew away from God. God had sent the judges, that's where we left them. But now the times were changing. The last judge of Israel was a judge by the name of Samuel. And Samuel came to be among the people, came to lead the people. And as I shared with the kids, he, he came as he was dedicated by Hannah, his mother. But where we pick up today, we pick up with a people who didn't want God. They didn't want God as their king any longer. They wanted to look like the rest of the nations around them. They wanted to look like the other nations who had kings around them, in particular the Philistines. Now, if you had an opportunity, which I hope you did, to, to look at the story before today, then you know that the, the Philistines were one of the arch enemies, so to speak, of the children of Israel. They were people who regularly were a thorn in their side, a people who seemed to always push the limits. And the Israelites always seemed to fall to them. Now and again you had them with a success here or there, but most of the time they were losing. And so they wanted to look like those Philistines. They wanted to be powerful like those Philistines. They wanted to blend in with those Philistines. The only problem was they weren't the Philistines. They were supposed to be God's chosen people. His people set apart. His people who were to look like him and not look like the rest of the world. And yet that's exactly what they look like. Now I don't know if you had a chance to read, but I'd like to catch you up a little bit here. You, you maybe can't blame the people so much for not wanting these judges. See, they, as you look at the, the people, who, the, the leaders, the judges even, they didn't always follow God. The priests didn't always follow God. You had Eli, who was supposed to be a spiritual leader of the people, whose sons, Hophni and Phinehas, well, they went far astray from what God had in mind. They perverted the justice. They, 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 they took the sacrifices that the people would bring, and they would eat the sacrifices instead of offering them to God. You think this made God happy? No. And so the Philistines came and defeated them. Well, the, Hophni and Phinehas, thinking that they would have God on a leash, they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle and they brought the Ark of the Covenant and it was captured. Now if you read, you know that God gets it back for his people, but God can't be held on a leash. So that brings us to the modern day. The people cry out for a king. And this is monumental. To us, this may not seem like much, but this was huge for them because this was a rejection of God. Listen to the conversation that God and Samuel had. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. At this point, God's people were a true theocracy. They were a people who were ruled by God in every sense of the word. But they didn't want that. They didn't want to be a people ruled by God. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. Did you catch that in the video there? It captures and summarizes it so well. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. And what does that look like? Chaos. Chaos. Because the people wanted it their way. And maybe this isn't so strange to us. Because some things never change, do they? Unfortunately, we see what doing it our way brings about. What chaos looks like in, in our lives, in our world, when we turn away from what God's desires are, when we turn away from what God's will is. Chaos. When God first came into the creation, he brought order to chaos. 
there was chaos and emptiness and God spoke into it. Order. With God there's order. Of our own there's chaos. But it goes on from there, doesn't it? Because this willful turning their back on God was a desire to, to not only serve other gods, but to not have the, Him part of their lives. Again, we look at our world around us. And it's not hard for us to imagine what this looks like. We look at a world that, where we turn our backs, where we turn back from what God's desires are. Even we as Christians, we know how true this is because we live in our lives, lives that so often we turn our backs. We turn back from what God's Word says. Most of you know the stories that were shared in the video a few moments ago. You know the stories of God's Word. You know His commands. Maybe you don't know all the Ten Commandments, each of them in order, but you, you have a, pre, a pretty good idea. But we want to live things our way. That old pride within ourselves leads us to want to live our own way. There's an author, a Danish author from the last century, 19th century, by the name of Hans Christian Andersen. Do you all know Hans Christian Andersen? I thought a few of you would know him. I was first introduced to him uh, back uh, my parent, my grandparents had a video called Hans Christian Andersen. And Danny Kay was the main character. And I see you nodding art, so maybe some of you also have seen this video. And in this video, it, it shares some of Hans Christian Andersen's uh, his, his, uh, fairy tales. Now, if you want, you can read the fairy tales because they're online anyway, translated. But... There's one of his fairy tales that's always stuck out to me, and it's the Ugly Duckling fairy tale. Now, before Disney got their hands on it, it had a great message to people. And it goes a little like this. There's an ugly duckling who was born. He was bigger than all the rest. Well, he was rather hatched. He was bigger than all the rest of the ducklings, and, and none of the, his brothers and sisters, so to speak, his siblings, cared for him. Even his own mother wished that he would have not been hatched. He was so ugly. And eventually he runs away from the farm that he's on because nobody likes him. Now all the rest of the animals, the older animals, look down on him and they say, that is the worst looking duckling we've ever seen. So he goes off on his own. He wanders off and he wanders around and he finds some wild ducks. Well, again, he's not welcomed by those wild ducks and they, just, and they push him aside. So he finds this farm, this, another farm to live in where there's an old woman and there's a cat and there's a hen and... Well, the cat and the hen, they convince him that he's not worth anything because he's not even, uh, he can't even function as a duck, so how could he be worth anything? So he goes off on his own. He weathers the winter all by himself. He goes out there when spring comes and he's ready to just be done. If nobody can accept him anywhere, he'd rather just be, be done with everything. So he comes across some swans. And he figures these are the most beautiful of animals, the most beautiful of birds. And they won't have anything to do with him, he's certain of. In fact, he, he expects because he's so ugly that, that they would rather just put him out of his misery, so to speak. But when he encounters these swans, and he, when he comes to the swans, he catches a reflection of himself. And what surprises him as he sees that reflection is, is he sees a beautiful swan. See, over the winter, over as the spring came, he had matured. He was no longer, no, no longer awkward and ugly, but he was a beautiful swan. And those swans, they welcomed him in. And when the children saw the swans, they said that he was the most beautiful of the swans because he was young. Not, not like those ducklings. And I tell you this story, and I summarize Anderson's story, because sometimes we, we in this world, we think that we need to look like all the ducklings. We in this world, we think that we need to blend in, that we have to look like everyone else around us. We think that as we look at the world, that if we don't fit in, that there's nothing there for us. That if, 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 that if we look any different than our coworkers, well, they might laugh at us or reject us. That if we, don't, that if we stand out in our family, that if we, if we don't live our faith, that well, maybe they'll be, a little, be kinder to us. And, and we live these lives thinking that, convinced by the world, that if we look like the world, we'll be okay. 
God in his word says, no. To me, you're beautiful. And I don't want you to look like the world. You are my chosen people whom I have set apart. You are my people who I have made unique and wonderfully. My people who I want to live out your faith in the world that you are in. The problem with God's people that that Samuel went to is that they wanted to blend in. They didn't understand what it meant to be a unique child of God, to live out their, them, to live as, their, as God's people in the world. See, what, what, did the, what did God intend for them? Had they lived according to his plan, he wanted them to be the example, the light to the world, to be the ones who shared the good news, who proclaimed the good news, who brought people to him. But instead they blended in. God has the same desires for us. He doesn't want us to blend in. He wants us to be in the world, no doubt about it. To live our faith out in the world, certainly. But not to blend in with the world. But to live out loud in the world. To live out our faith in such a way that other people say, what is different about that person? You know, there's a song, I love it, and we've sung it a few times, almost sang it this Sunday. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And I love that song because it talks about how do we look like God's people in the world? We don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have everything put together. Our families might still argue. We might not always get along with our spouse. Our children might argue with us as well. We might not be the most popular. But they'll know we are Christians by our love reminds us what it means to look like God's people. It means to show God's love to others in the world. To live out God's love in the world. To care for others in the world. And this doesn't have to be a mission trip. It can be a mission trip. It can be going to to distant shores or going into difficult places. Or it can be sharing God's love with your family. Sharing the good news of what God has done for them. A lot of you heard it yesterday, but one of the most beautiful examples that, that, that that I heard was not something that I preached, but it was something that Julie shared. Julie was talking about how she, right before her cousin died, she was in his hospital room with him. And you know what she said to him? She said, Jason, Jesus loves you. Sometimes that's what, all we need to do is share that truth. Jesus loves you. Because as much as we think that the world knows that truth, as much as we imagine that the world must know Jesus loves them because we know that truth, they don't. Not all the world knows that good news message, that Jesus loves them. Many of them are just trying to get by from day to day. People outside the church are just trying to figure out how they're going to make ends meet, how they're going to get through uh, another, another year. They don't know that simple phrase, Jesus loves you. Do you know that phrase? Do you remember that phrase? Say it with me, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Have you said that out loud in a while? It's great to sing with kids because you you do get to sing those words all the time. But it's easy for us as adults to forget sometimes that the simple message of the gospel, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me so much that he sent his son into, that he came into the world, that that the father sent his son into the world to die for us. Jesus loves me so much that he died on the cross for my sins. Jesus loves me so much that he put aside his godliness so that I might be with him forever. Jesus loves me so much that he rose from the grave and even now prepares a place for me. Remember, being a Christian in the world doesn't mean that you have to have all the right words, be the perfect person. It means that you share the good news. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. He has forgiven me and given me new life. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, sometimes it's easy to try to blend in with the world. It's easy to think that standing up for you means being on a street corner, yelling at people and hollering at people and telling them all the things that they've done wrong. Except when we look at your word, you show us a different example. It's not that you accept sin. It's not that you pretend it's not there, but 
but you love us so much that you, that you sent your son. That you sent your son to conquer our sin. To conquer our sin with, your, with his own precious sufferings and death. Lord, help us to remember that truth. Help us to remember that truth when we go to our families, when we go into our communities, when we see, and when we go into our workplaces. That living out our faith means sharing with others your love, your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. Sharing your love with others is not about having all the right answers, putting on airs as if our lives are perfect, but instead sharing that simple truth that Jesus loves them, that that's why he came into this world, so that all of us could be with him forever. Lord, help us be bold to share that truth. Help us be bold to share that good news. And help us be bold to not only say those words, but to, sh to live out those words so that others too may know that Jesus loves them. This we pray in Jesus' name.